order the Cape Elizabeth Town Council meeting of July 8th. It's uh, 7 p.m. and I'll ask the clerk to call roll, roll call for us. Chairman Walsh. Here. Councilor Guvenali. Here. Councilor Jordan. Here. Councilor Ray. Here. Councilor Sherman. Here. Councilor Sullivan. And Councilor Wagner. Here. Thank you. If you'd all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, States of America and, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First item on the agenda is the Town Council reports and correspondence. Are there any reports? Yes, Frank? The uh, Library Committee has been meeting every other week, it seems, very, uh, a lot of meetings. And we're meeting again tomorrow afternoon. And um, throughout the process, it would be really helpful to get input from the public. And the meetings are open. And we invite folks who have a point of view or interest in what's happening in terms of the Library Committee to uh, join our meetings. And our meeting tomorrow is at? Uh, I think it's at 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock in the morning tomorrow morning. OK, great. Well, thank you. Um, there, yes, David. Uh, the Town Center Planning Committee, or update to the Town Center Planning Committee, is meeting July 15th, this coming Monday at 4 p.m. in the Town Hall for anybody who's interested in providing input to that committee. Great. Thank you. Anything else? All right. Well, let's move on to Finance Committee. Anything, Frank, for us? I know we have a, an agenda item today that uh, we'll address some of the issues, but is there anything you'd like to add? The, uh, the only other issue is as it relates to the, uh, <coughs> the uh, capital planning process. Um, uh, Mike and I will be getting together um, shortly to discuss uh, municipal forecasts. And I've been in uh, constant dialogue with um, uh, Michael Moore on the uh, school side. And once we've got both sides um, sort of fine-tuned, we'll look to combine the efforts so we can present to the council and the public. Uh, what the outlook looks like. So hopefully that'll be done in the next few weeks. Very good. Thank you for your leadership on that. We appreciate it very much. Now we come to the first item um, where we offer a citizen opportunity to discuss items that are not on today's agenda. There are agendas in the back of the room, so if you weren't sure what our agenda looked like today. Is there anybody who wishes to address us on items that are not? Please or come to the podium, and, and if you would be so kind as to uh, tell us your name and uh, your address and uh... hi my name is Carl Dittrich 500 Ocean House Road thank you um, just two minutes of your time um, you have three I have three minutes great um, I'm all for charities but what I would ask the council if it's possible if they could put on the website a complete listing of all the races that are involved in Cape Elizabeth I had an incident last Saturday as I was coming with my lobster meat and ice cream from Portland and the road was blocked off here right at the Cumberland Farms and they were short staffed and short tempered the police were and so I finally got to be able to go down Scott Dyer Road and go all the way around I saw um, Chief Williams at the end and I said is there a crash or if I no, there's a race well I didn't know about that uh, last year um, I was going at the, I was driving from the center of town to the corner of Fowler and 77 and there was another race and there was a man working for the race, he didn't know, but he had two red flags and he was waving them for the bikers to go around the turn and the woman in front of me obviously thought that they were waving at her so she jammed in her brakes, it was kind of scary. Um, you know, nothing against charities, you know, it's our gift to the world, the road races and everything else, but it would be nice so I can plan my summer. Um, to know, you know, what's going on in the town, whether they're big races, little races, anything. So that's my first minute. The second thing that I would ask is that, um, I don't know if anyone on the council has looked at the town website. Under the recreation, there's a little video. Um, and twice on the video, what they show is um, the pier that's in Scarborough. And I'm thinking, well, our town's too beautiful to show the pier in Scarborough on the Spurwink River. And then the one shot they show of Portland Headlight is these giant buses in, front, in the parking lot. Um, and they show the shore pathway, and they don't really show the pathway, just a clump of people. Just my recommendation, maybe it could be updated. And for my last minute, I would ask that um, the men of the spandex, the big bikers, the big bike groups, I don't know if anyone's familiar with them, 
um, the men of the spandex, um, their motto, bikers, I thought was share the road. Well, my feeling is, you know, God bless you, go out there, run, ride your bike <clears throat> down 77, but, you know, everyone knows that, uh, you know, the three main roads, and Mitchell and Shore Road aren't really set up for bikes. I don't understand why they, they can't go single file on the roads that don't have the big bike lanes, because um, I, I have to travel that to, to get to work, and, you know, going 14 miles an hour, I, it just, it's frustrating, and I'm not going to go around them, and so it just doesn't seem fair. Unless I decide, okay, I'm going to walk to work and I'm going to walk down Shore Road in the middle of the road. Mm -hmm. That's all. Okay. Thanks. The operative word is men in spandex, I think. That's what I heard here. Oh, uh, women. It's women, too. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I just, uh, Michael, I just, uh, I, and again, I would encourage you, I mean, I'm sure you've spoken to Neil Williams about this or any of these issues, so I would just continue to suggest or recommend that you communicate to him. But also, um, now I, town manager, is a couple of notes to follow up on. So, appreciate it. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to address the council on items not on today's agenda? Seeing none, let's move to the town manager's report. Michael? Uh, yes, thanks, Jim. I wanted to give an update on a couple of items. First, I again want to thank the Family Fun Day Committee uh, for all their efforts. <coughs> Family Fun Day has happened since the last meeting of the council. It was back on June 4th, 15th. And Every indication is that it was very successful, and with there's a, again a very small group of volunteers that put that whole day on. And if anyone is interested in assisting them, uh, it'd be most appreciated. And we will be needing some more volunteers for next year. So. It looked like from Wendy's report that that was the the highest hit on our website it was over a thousand hits for the Family Fun Day, which yeah. is kind of interesting. How very popular people are. What's going on? Uh, on July 13th, there's going to be an event at Fort Williams Park uh, that shouldn't cause a whole lot of traffic, a spandex crowd. Uh, it's a dedication of a stamp. Uh, it's at 10 a.m. by the U.S. Postal Service. Uh, it's one of five new stamps issued as part of the New England Coastal Lighthouse Stamp Series. Uh, Jim is going to be there doing a welcome from the town. Uh, Bill Green from Channel 6 is going to be the MC and there's a member of the Board of Governors of the Postal Service, and it just sounds like a nice event. Uh, public's welcome, 10 o'clock on July 13th. Uh, third, we've received notice from FEMA unofficially before some official maps are released uh, that they're revising the floodplain maps for the town of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, and there's about 45 homes which a consultant that we've had working for us have been that appear that currently were not in the official floodplain, but once these maps are issued, if they're issued as they are, would be in the floodplain. Uh, six of them are on the, in the Lawson Road area, uh, five at Alewife Cove area, eight at Peebles Cove, and then the rest are scattered throughout the town. Uh, we are going to be sending letters out uh, within the next few days to about 250 property owners. Uh, informing them that, that these maps are available. Uh, in the 250 includes folks that are already in the floodplain in case they have questions, as well as to these 45 homes that will be in the floodplain if these, the FEMA map passes, uh, is approved. Uh, it, it's fairly significant for the property owners in, in two regards. One, it's, it's a notice that you're in a place that's susceptible to danger, and as we saw in Hurricane Sandy, uh, it's something to be concerned about. And secondly, it has major implications for insurance cost uh, and the need to get national flood insurance. So if, particularly if you're in those areas I mentioned, I'd encourage you to, to touch base with Ben McDougall, our code enforcement officer. Uh, you know, we, we did discuss at the staff level maybe hiring the consultant to help with appeals for this, but it, it's very, looking at it, it was very difficult to do because there's, just the cost for the consultant for the Lawson Road, the ALY Peebles area, was $17,000. And then how do you address, or how could we address the other approximately 25 homes that aren't in those areas? And, you know, at what point does the town involve itself in, in essentially an issue between citizens and the federal government? So anyway, that's, that's a little bit of background on that. It's about 45 homes. And... Uh, it's something, you know, we've gone back and forth with FEMA for a couple of years on, 
and it's it's amazing the way FEMA has gone back and forth on this issue and has not come to you know claim that they're going to do things and hasn't and they haven't done them uh, and uh, <clears throat> Cape Elizabeth's not in this alone. Scarborough uh, has a lot more impact than we do uh, from these proposed new flood maps and other towns uh, in uh, both Cumberland and York counties. Uh, um, Michael, is there going to be any kind of public education from FEMA, or is it uh, simply? You know, you know, they make good promises, but you know, they, I, I can't speak for. I, I, I hesitate to speak for FEMA. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the gentleman that we were working for who gave us all these promises we, we just found out was actually a contract employee of FEMA, wasn't a FEMA employee, and w his contract was not renewed. He was sort of the project manager, and I, I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can only guess why that might not have happened. It might have been funding issues. It might have been other issues I don't know. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, fortunately, uh, Bob Gerber uh, uh, has worked with us with Ransom Consulting, uh, who lives, <coughs> lives here in Cape Elizabeth, and he's, he's also the consultant that all the other communities have utilized to, to mm -hmm. try to impact in a, and to keep us all up to date on what FEMA is doing. And you know, it's, it's something we've probably invested about you know, $10,000 in over the last three years, uh, you know, just trying to keep, keep up on it and, and uh, working with the other communities and, and with the congressional delegation. Uh, I had a couple more items, but I want to take a quick little break to have Deb uh, Lane update <coughs> on nomination papers. Um, today I was looking at the calendar and find that at the end of this month, nomination papers for council and school board for the November election will be available. Um, we have nomination papers available again. There are two seats on the council, two seats on the school board. They are three-year terms each. Um, nomination papers will be available in my office beginning on Monday, July 29th, and the nomination paper deadline will be Friday, September 6th. So if anyone is interested, please see me sometime between July 29th and the first part of September. And that information will also uh, be posted on our website within the next couple of days. So if folks need a reminder when those uh, deadlines are. So thank you. Thank you. I also wanted to update the council and everyone else that the planning board is, is has continuing to look at the issue of building permit notification and the definition of normal high watermark and we expect that those may come back to the council in August uh, with a report from the planning board uh, on those two issues. I uh, want to mention that the police department's been fairly busy. We've had four burglaries in homes when people have been in them uh, during the evening hours. Uh, the, there was an arrest in Falmouth that has been in the newspaper that is associated with some, if not all, of these burglaries. Uh, but again, uh, all of the homes were apparently unlocked. People were in them at night, but they're unlocked, and particularly during this time of year, just a caution to everyone that uh, these things, even though we have one of the lowest crime rates around, these things do happen in Cape Elizabeth, and uh, I don't think anyone wants to wake up and discover <coughs> someone in their home. So, uh, But anyway, they, they, there was an arrest of a, an adult and a juvenile. Uh, in, in Falmouth uh, at, uh, at Highland Lake that they were actually, had sort of moved into someone's home. Uh, so uh, s something to be concerned about. Uh, did want to mention we have a new police officer beginning on uh, July 29th. His name is Darren Estes. He's a new Cape Elizabeth resident, has worked 21 years with the Lisbon, Maine uh, Police Department, and uh, he, he's filling a vacancy as a result of Andy Steindl having retired as a sergeant, and the sergeant uh, uh, positions also will be filled uh, sometime that later this summer. But this is re this is in anticipation of someone moving up to sergeant, and uh, the officer position being available. I, I did want to uh, address Carl's concerns for a brief minute. Uh, I think it's a great idea to have the listing of all road races uh, on the website. Uh, it. Uh, we, we actually discussed them this morning at, at a department head meeting that, you know, they just, we seem to be getting more and more road races all the time with different charities, you know, wanting to utilize our roads and uh, other assets. And, you know, we, we have fire police unit who, while they're paid a little bit for responding, it, it's, you know, it's difficult for us as a small community to staff these things as well for 
public safety issues, you know, every weekend during the summer. Uh, there's a few more coming up. There's the, there's the uh, Try for the Cure, if I could have this name right, uh, which is the, the, the bicycle swim race that the Maine Cancer Foundation does, and that involves a lot of particularly bicycles going around Cape Elizabeth. Uh, there is the something for preservation that the land trust does, which is coming up, uh, that involves, again, swimming over, out by Crescent Beach Kettle Cove, but also involves some running and, I believe, some biking. Uh, it's a triathlon. So, you know, all of these do have impacts, and, and there may be others as well. There's, I have no idea the ones that you were talking about, Carl, but, uh, you know, there's the Pond Cove Challenge. There's, there's all these different races, and it would, I think it would be really helpful uh, to have a complete listing of them and to assess our ability to, to keep up with them. And, and briefly on, on the video that uh, Kyle mentioned, uh, it, I was involved in, when they produced that video a year ago, it was an outfit out of New York who came and did filming. And that was, it was decided to leave it in because it's right on the Cape, the, the river where the kayakers are shown are right on, they're right on the Cape Elizabeth border there. And, it was to show that kayaking is a recreational opportunity here in Cape Elizabeth, and it was photogenic. And yes, it does show a, a, a bridge that's actually a, a dock that's on the Scarborough side, but they access the beautiful waters of Cape Elizabeth from that dock. So, uh, you know, one of those, it, it's, I suppose it's borderline in more ways than one uh, to include it. <clears throat> anyway, uh, I have a bunch of other things here, but in the interest of time, uh, I think we'll move on. Thank you. Good. Any uh, questions for the manager? No? Yes. Um, I just wanted to uh, mention that um, I understand what Carl is saying, and um, as a resident of Cape Elizabeth, I think we have to keep in mind that um, the inconvenience for Cape residents when they close roads, um, especially on the weekends, because it seems like it seems to be happening more and more. And I know for me personally that we have been inconvenienced several times when the road's been closed. And so I think we have to keep it in mind when we say, yes, we will do this or we will allow this, that we sort of try to balance that between it's a great place to ride a bike or have a run or whatever, and how many weekends are going to have uh, roads closed. So. Yeah, I didn't even mention the Beach to Beacon. Uh, it was one of the upcoming events. So. And, and neither did I. <laughs> and I won't go there. <laughs> yeah, and we've had some conversation with yes, we have. about that, too. Yes, we have. Yes. <laughs> and and I, that is I think an I think for everyone to see a list, not only the ones that are coming up, but to get a list of all the ones that happen in a calendar year, I think would be interesting, instructive, and uh, might have policy implications. Thank you. All right. Jim. Anything else? Yes, David. I just had two questions. There is a uh, structure near the lighthouse that is new, which appears to be related to the postage stamp display. No. It's not. Okay. I was wondering if you could enlighten us on what that is. Yeah, it's a. It's for the greeters. Actually, they were exposed to the elements, and you know, I'm not convinced. We've had discussions at the staff level about its exact placement, and that it, it, you know, it doesn't. As you say, you think it's. You don't know its purpose, and uh, it needs to be out in front to clear that it is for greeting and for, for being helpful. But uh, it is to, to shade the, the folks that are there from the direct sun, from the rain, the other elements, and to, and to, and to uh, keep the brochures and other materials from getting soaked. But it, uh, it's, a, it's a temporary structure, can be moved, and we're, we're having continuing discussions on whether or not the location it is is the best location. And then my second question is a response to Carl's comments, which is I, I do find the, the large group of bicyclists, especially on Saturday mornings, to pose a real danger uh, to both them and drivers, and I typically just follow them for a long distance, and that's life. But I am worried sometimes when people try to pass them, it appears to be quite dangerous. So I, I don't know what can be done about that, but it might be worth some follow-up with the chief of police. Yeah, I, I didn't address that comment because I'm not sure what can be done about them. As, as Carl said, you know, it, it is about sharing the road and people need to be patient. <clears throat> and, you know, they also need to be smart about what they do, as we've, we've seen from other incidents in other places, uh, you know. 
Well, since I'll let the chief know that the issue came up. And okay. We'll put right. our heads together. Good. Mike. Yeah, good, yeah, Frank. The, some of those are organized by bicycle shops in Portland. Maybe at minimum, if uh, Neil could just talk to the bicycle shops and express yeah. their yeah. concern, maybe yeah. that would help yeah. control them a little bit. Yeah, it comes up as an issue every year. and. Well, it's actually come up uh, for more discussion recently since the, the incident and the, um, you know, the Sunday River race. I mean, it, yep. uh, it certainly has become even more in terms of what the rules of the road are and what, uh, you know, what bicyclists should be, should be following. So, uh, I, you know, I think, we, I think the comment to go to some of the bike shops and maybe have a conversation about it, but it is, it is a problem. There's no question. And for, and for someone who is a biker, I, I'm very cognizant of it, and, and it annoys me too. Um, because when I'm on the road, I keep, you know, I keep out of traffic. But they, they, there are, you know, a peloton of folks going down the road. It's, uh, it's a little tough. So, but um, anyway, so noted. Any other questions from Michael? Just on or, that, uh, Jamie, on the biking issue, I, I just had my brother-in-law in for the weekend from the Cincinnati area, and uh, he mentioned that a police chief told him that maybe he shouldn't be biking in that area because it was more of a car-friendly area. So I wouldn't want to veer too far the other direction because we are a, a bike-friendly town. And if, if car drivers are inconvenienced for a short time period, I think that might be the price that you have to pay for a, a bike-friendly community. Hmm. Okay. Anything, Anything else? Just, yes, Michael. Just <clears throat> drivers are more and more impatient and sometimes do unwise things, particularly on the curvy sections of Shore Road, that, you know, another minute might save them a lot of long-term <coughs> bike's agony. Uh, so. Okay, um, moving to the next item, which would be um, a review and acceptance of the minutes of June 10th. I, have motion. I move to accept the minutes from our June 10, 2013 meeting. And do I have a second, Frank? Thank you. Any um, comments, suggestions, improvements, amendments? Seeing none, um, all those in favor? All those opposed, unanimous. Moving on to the first item on today's agenda, that's a public hearing for the Fort Williams Park vendor regulations. That's item number 97. And that is, uh, let's see, we'll turn it over to Kathy just briefly here and then we'll open up the public hearing. Okay, um, what I'm going to do is just read the um, memo that we have sent um, to the Town Council from the Ordinance Committee. And just as an introduction, the Town Council referred to the Ordinance Committee the following, a review of vendor locations at Fort Williams Park. More specifically, the Town Council would like the committee to review with Tom Leahy legal aspects of ordinance provisions regulating to the right, relating, excuse me, to the rights of street artists to utilize the park for the sale of goods. The Ordinance Committee met with John Wall representing Monaghan Leahy LLC. John Wall reviewed court decisions regarding the First Amendment rights of vendors who are expressing themselves through their art. The committee discussed a possible two-tier approach. The first tier would be an amendment to the Fort Williams section of the Miscellaneous Offenses Ordinance that explicitly authorizes the Town Council to adopt rules for Fort Williams Park. That amendment is attached and you have that in your packet. Uh, the second tier would be promulgation of rules which would be developed in conjunction with the Fort Williams Advisory Committee and subject to adoption by the Town Council. The Ordinance Committee expressed concern with preserving the aesthetic, historic and open space characteristics of the park and also respecting the rights of park visitors to express their First Amendment rights. They discussed how development of park rules would protect the park and First Amendment rights. By a vote of three to zero, the Ordinance Committee recommends to the Town Council the amendments to section 12-4-8 and 12-4-9 of the Miscellaneous <coughs> Offenses Ordinance. Great, thank you, Kath. I'll open up the public hearing. If anybody wishes to address the Council, please, uh, please, uh, Approach the podium and introduce yourself, your name and address. And uh... Good evening, my name is Chris Christensen and I live at 40 Alewife Cove Road, Cape Elizabeth. I've been an artist all my life and I've sold my art in over 15 countries with no problems. 
In fact, I have always found a warm welcome and the recognition that artists add to the cultural health and diversity of any town or city. Having learned that artists actually have First Amendment rights under the constitution of this country, I assumed that welcome would extend here as well. I have been selling my artwork in Fort Williams Park since May 6th this year, the only artist to do so to my knowledge. Some of my work is displayed here this evening for everybody to see. And have, uh, I am disappointed that after only two months, the town of Cape Elizabeth sees me as a problem to be regulated and banished to an unsuitable location. As far as I can tell from the description in the proposed rules, that site is beside a very dusty gravel car park. A bad thing for my art and my asthma. The ground is sloping, narrow and uneven, forcing my artwork to either face the direct sun or completely turn its back to the public. The sharp slope has no pathways and is unsafe and inaccessible, uh, inaccessible to the elderly, disabled, wheelchairs and baby strollers. The site also deliberately excludes me from a whole section of the public who arrive by bus or trolley and are dropped off and collected in the lighthouse circle. Only empty buses go to the car park. I have also experienced harassment by some of the town's vendors. One of the gift shop art vendors made a racial slur about my nationality, but mostly the vendors were misinformed and accused me of not paying while they pay either fixed fee percentage to the town or uh, pay a fixed fee or a percentage to the town. Since that is not true, I would like to read excerpts from the letter I wrote to the town manager on March the 4th, 2013. <clears throat> I would like to experiment with the concept of street art in a small way by setting up with an easel and small table of my work in Fort Williams Park. From my understanding, this is an acceptable practice in public spaces and I have seen other artists in Fort Williams Park do this already, selling prints and books on the sidewalk between the gift shop and museum. I would prefer to be further away from the lighthouse, both from the point of view of it being very crowded already, and out of respect for the gift shop, museum, and other street artists and food vendors who are all trying to attract business as well. I thought of setting up somewhere between the bathroom area and the main car park, but not directly on the path or in the car park to avoid obstruction or safety issues. Fort Williams Park is a wonderful asset to the town and beautifully cared for, and in appreciation I would be very willing to donate a percentage of my sales towards the upkeep of the park. I am writing because I didn't want to set up in the park totally unannounced and cause conflict and confusion. I would much rather my intentions were known in advance and the town had no objections or concerns. I would of course be very happy to hear any thoughts or suggestions you may have on my proposal. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else who wishes to address council? Please come forward and um, state your name and your address. Hello, my name is Marilyn Christensen and I live at 40 LF Cove Road. Any artist who exhibits their work in a public place does so under the legal umbrella of the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. That artist, whether they choose to sell or exhibit their work, is not a commercial vendor under the law. They are a member of the general public exercising their constitutional right to freedom of speech. As odd as that may sound, that is the law as, as it stands today, and the question of regulating artists in Fort William Park is a constitutional issue, not just something the town can make rules about if no one objects. A town-employed lawyer confirmed to the manager and members of the Ordinance Committee at their May 30th meeting that an artist has the right to set up in a public place with very few restrictions, basically because they cannot be treated differently to any other visitor to the park. Under the law, they are not subject to the same regulations as a commercial vendor. The town lawyer informed the Ordinance Committee they cannot restrict artists to a disadvantaged area of the park, and when a committee member asked how the town might limit the number of artists setting up, the lawyer said the only limit was the size of the park. We were in Canada when the Fort Williams Advisory Commission held their June 20th meeting to formulate the rules proposed tonight, and no minutes of that meeting had been posted on the website. So I would ask the town council before voting on these new rules to share with all of us here and at home the details of the legal precedent they are now using to ignore their lawyer's previous advice. 
It is more than a little hypocritical of the town to talk about preserving the pristine beauty of the lighthouse from commercialism when they have a shop, museum, several outdoor art vendors, two food vendors, and a brand new wooden shed to house the person collecting $40 from every bus, all clustered around the lighthouse. The po proposed rules both restrict numbers to eight artists in a 90-acre park and seek to disadvantage artists by placing them on an uneven piece of ground beside a gravel park prone to heavy dust storms. It sits on top of a sharp slope with no path and is inaccessible and unsafe for elderly disabled wheelchairs and strollers. It removes the artist well away from visitors who arrive by coach, trolley or taxi. I trust the council members have taken the time to view the proposed location in person before they vote. As much as the town would like to place artists far away from their own commercial activities to limit competition, as the City of Portland discovered within the last few months, the First Amendment does not allow such blatant restrictions of location. The American Civil Liberties Union in Maine helped Portland formulate their new rules and told the city it would take legal action if they didn't change some of their restrictive proposals. Based on that legal advice, Portland's new ordinance for artists contains no restrictions on location or number of artists, apart from where public safety is a genuine concern. Our town council, which includes three lawyers, should think very carefully before rushing to make new regulations for a non-existent problem of one artist, when in all probabilities these rules are unconstitutional and expose the town to costly lawsuits they would likely lose. As well as continually confusing artists with commercial vendors, the final section of Cape Elizabeth's new rules talks about the town revoking an artist's privilege to set up in the park if they don't abide by the rules. This illustrates how completely the town have either misunderstood or chosen to ignore the legal issues involved and the constitutional rights of the artist. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to address us? If you could give us your name and your address, appreciate it. Bill Brownell, 9 Cedar Ledge Road, Cape Elizabeth. I am presently the chair of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. <coughs> and I just want to give a very brief background to, from the commission's perspective as to where we are, to, how we got here and what the commission did. There was an exchange of correspondence between the Christiansons and, and Mike McGovern this spring that resulted after a while of the meeting of the Ordinance Committee, following which uh, the town manager and I met with Tom Leahy, the town attorney, because the commission was directed to propose some re regulations to the council. And uh, I and, 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 uh, and Mike asked Tom Leahy if he would be uh, willing to take the, the uh, laboring oar and draft the proposed regulations. He did that. He did that with the guidance of the case law that uh, is on the books. There is no case law that was found in the First Circuit or in the, in the state of Maine, but there is several very recent Second Circuit cases on this topic arising out of uh, various parks, Battery Park and other parks in New York City. And what the court has found in those cases is that the street artists do in fact have a First Amendment right to sell their wares in, on public property. But the governmental entity also has a right to restrict that business in appropriate, reasonable ways. And what the, what the town attorney did and what the commission has done, I think, is to draft a, a uh, proposed regulation that you have before you that is a product of the balancing of the vendor's rights as well as with the rights of the town and the right of the town to preserve and promote the scenic beauty of Fort Williams, to alleviate congestion and to improve circulation when necessary. The proposed regulations are very narrowly tailored. They 
uh, reasonable restrictions to meet these towns' interests while at the same time providing the vendors with ample opportunity to sell their wares. Following the circuit, the Second Circuit guidance, there is no permitting required, there's no registration required, there's no fees required of these vendors. But also following the precedent, there is a specifically designated area within the park where the vendors can establish their work. And this, the ability of the town to specifically locate these vendors uh, was, is clear in the cases that the town attorney found. And I, I believe uh, he, he tried to find anything to the contrary and he was unable to do so. While the, cir while the, the circle at the lighthouse may be the vendor's preference because of the high foot traffic at that location, that in and of itself supports the town's effort to regulate that location. We have proposed to allow eight street artists in the park. If we allow one street artist at the circle, we are opening ourselves up to have eight street artists at the, at the circle. The fact that there are food vendors there is a non-starter from our perspective. The food vendors pay a healthy fee to help maintain the park by the fact that they are providing food and drink to our guests. They are providing a service that the town, through the, the vendors, is, is, is offering to the, to the public. In essence, they're partners with the town. And of course, it's still a pilot program. Uh, I think, uh, I think the Christians should understand that there's no animus felt by the commission against street artists. Although the commission initially was reluctant to proceed because we, are, we were concerned that if we had one street artist, we may have many, many more. We, through the advice of town council, we understand that we can limit the number, we can limit reasonably the, the location. We can certainly limit the size of their displays. I, like my colleagues on the commission, they think that the regulations are very fair and very reasonable. Thank you. Thank Any you. questions? Um, yeah. I, in, in, as a matter of uh, a public hearing, I, I think I'd like to see if there's any additional public uh, input. And then we'll move to the next step, Jamie. And if you just hold your question, if you wouldn't mind. Thank you, Bill. Well, Appreciate there's it. Be, there's going to be a question of him. Yeah, I, I realize that. But, but I, I'd like to, rather than have that, then the question would be, why didn't you ask the Christensen's questions? I mean, the bottom line here is I'd like to get, uh, is there anyone else who wishes to address the council in this public hearing? Yes, Carl. If you just state your name again, Carl, and address, that'd be great. Carl Dittrich, 500 Ocean House Road. Didn't have anything prepared, just listened to the, the first two presenters. Um, they sound like they're threatening the town, and they don't sound like what I consider artists. I love art. But to me, they're saying, well, the commercial venture. It's, it's a totally a commercial venture. That's the only reason they're there. It, it's, a, it's a complete commercial venture. And where their position now is where when everyone comes from the upper parking lot down to the area, they're the first person they see. So they are now the face of Cape Elizabeth. Um, and from, from my perspective, um, I, could, I could be a street artist. I do art. Instead, I bought a $10,000 trolley, a $2,500 generator, a $900 ice cream freezer. I pay sales tax. I pay insurance. Um, it, it's, it's a ton of work. I, I support a commercial kitchen in Scarborough. 
um, where instead I could just, and then I have to have a, you know, a big pickup truck to move the whole thing every day. Instead, I could just drive down there with my birdhouse buoys or my art, set up anywhere I want, sell them. It, it makes no sense. What I don't understand is if the lighthouse is a 501c area and they're not allowed to go there, why couldn't the town transition the whole park or sell or gift it to the Fort Williams Advisory Committee or me and lease it, you know, make it a way that it's not so you can actually regulate what goes on in the park? I estimate the last year I did not a lot, but I did about 700 hours in Fort Williams. And the, the comment that the food vendors work with the park, I think, is true. I mean, I, I see a lot that goes on um, at the park. Um, it just doesn't seem fair. I have nothing against artists selling things, but it's going to become a circus if, it, if it's allowed. And, um, you know, the, it just doesn't seem right to me in so many ways to have them as the face of Cape Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to address the council in this uh, public hearing? Seeing none, I will call the public hearing closed. And I will then turn to the council if I could um, get a, um, a motion and second it, and then we can open up for discussion. Kathy. Okay. I, if, I think if we're still on that same first piece that I move that we adopt uh, the new section 12.4.8, regulation of park activities, and 12.4.9, uh, the penalty. Uh, both of which you have in front of you. I have a second. 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 Thank you, David. We'll open it up for discussion. Jamie, if you would like to address your question, we could uh, we could ask uh, Bill Brownell for his uh, a moment to respond, if he would. Sure. Bill, how many members of the of the advisory committee? There's seven members. Okay, seven. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Yes, Jamie. Could, could you show me where on the map? Uh, the proposed location for the artist would be? <clears throat> yeah, this the, it's the really proposed important. location yep. would be in this area right here, adjacent to the main parking lot. And right, people coming down the hill, they'd be right in front of all the traffic coming into <coughs> the uh, lighthouse area. Oh, I see. They're right. And that's true. Kind of, that's a little bit below where the uh, picnic area is up above the that's covered. Right. Yeah. 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 Yes. It, it's important to realize too, Jamie, that, that um, this is the second item on the agenda, the proposed Fort Williams Park vending regulations. Okay, yeah. It's a separate, but, but it is for clarity purposes. Um, Bill, could you address the, the comments that the Christiansons have made about that location, just for the record, since you're up there, rather than drag you out of your seat again? Um, I, th I think that's a very suitable um, location. Without putting words in Bob Malley's um, mouth, um, he advised the commission that that was a very good site, that it was level, accessible, mm -hmm. um, very public in nature. Uh, with the, the size on both the width and the length and the depth okay. uh, that would meet their needs. All right. Okay, well, thank you. Appreciate that. Any other yeah, questions? Yeah, Kath yeah. Oh, sorry, Bill. Yeah, Bob, Bob said that, and the commission all agreed to that as well. Oh, they did. Yeah. Okay, great. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I was down there today to just to check out this, the location as well. Um, I thought that would be an important um, uh, and, uh, decision. And also, uh, Michael decided to have this um, uh, photograph uh, blown up and printed for us to review and to reference tonight. Kathy, you had a question. I, I just wanted to remind the council that what, we're, what the proposal is at this point are two, is twofold. One is that we're authorizing the town council to authorize to adopt rules and regulations. And the second piece is that a person who's found to violated those provisions mm -hmm. can be um, can be fined, and that's the piece that we're that right. The that's what's on the table today, we're right now. Voting on the second piece about the regulations, what is which is the proposal from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, is not yeah. up for 
vote at this moment. So right. I just wanted to make sure that Great. we were clear with that there Thank was a you, twofold that. piece. Yeah. Any other any any other discussions? Anyone, David? Well, yeah, I would be to sort of echo what Kathy said. I'd be prepared to vote, and I will vote in favor of the proposed ordinance amendment. But then we'll deal we'll with reserve that. comment for the proposed for the rules section. for the next yep. agenda item. Okay. Any other, Frank? Just a question. So we're going to vote on penalties for rules that we might adopt. Should well, we do it the 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 penalty provision is already in the ordinance. The only aspect of the penalty provision that's being amended is my understanding that it's, uh, instead of leaving it as a fine of $250, it's a fine of $250 per day. I think that's really a, a, an effort to clarify the penalty provision, but that is already in the ordinance. So we, you know, the, in the, there's a change in the numbering because the regulation of park activities is section 12-4-8. The penalty is now bumped back to 12-4-9. Right. Um, what, what we're uh, voting on is to authorize the town council to set up rules. Right. That, right. That's not in the provision. Right. So we're authorizing the town council to set up rules. Then later we will discuss the pr proposal of right. what the rules are. Okay. Jamie, you had a question? Yeah, just a point of semantics on the, the proposed change to the penalty provision. It now would read per day of infraction, but this is referring back to several sections preceding it, including like pet excrement removal. Now, that wouldn't be per day of infraction. That's supposed to be per infraction. Jim? I can answer that. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, this is based on section 11-7 uh, one, one of the, the ordinances. And there's a provision there uh, that says uh, each day any violation of any provision of this code or any ordinance shall continue shall constitute a separate offense. And, but I, it's important, what, what reads above that says that if it isn't specifically mentioned in the ordinance, that this 117 would take hold. So we've always had the principle of, in the ordinance from the, the very first <coughs> chapter, that every single day that an infraction takes place is a separate offense. It's, it's, it's you know, routine municipal ordinance construction. Mm -hmm. So does that answer the semantics question for you, Jamie? So you can have two pet excrement violations in a day and only have to pay for one infraction. That's right. Okay. But if it's two days in a row. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Didn't we have a pet excrement conversation earlier today, Mike? Uh, don't remind me. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> any, other, uh, any other conversation or questions from the council? No? Okay. Okay, seeing no uh, further discussion, um, I'll move the question. All those in favor? All those opposed? And it's unanimous. Moving to item 98, a proposed Fort Williams Park vending regulation. Uh, the chair will entertain a motion. Kathy. I move that we accept the proposed Fort Williams Park vending regulations as proposed by the Fort Williams Advisory Commission as uh, previously discussed by Bill and is in your packet for this evening. I have a second. I'll second the motion. David, second. Um, we'll open up to discussion. Um, Bill, did you want to add any additional comments? I mean, you outlined it earlier. Is there anything further? No. Okay. Um, we, um, you have that in front of you, folks. Um, is there anything specific anyone wishes to address? David. This is a, another attempt, it seems, at a balancing act, and we're trying to balance the First Amendment rights of people like the Christiansons uh, with the town's desire to maintain Fort Williams in uh, its scenic state. Uh, and we also, of course, are balancing the town's desire to make money from its gift shop, which has been there for many, many years, associated with the museum. And the concern I have about uh, an influx of, of a lot of um, artists selling their artwork is that it will detract from the scenic beauty of that section of Fort Williams. It will, uh, if there are, if there were unlimited numbers, uh, and that seems to sort of uh, kill the goose that's laying the golden egg. All of a sudden, you're you're having a a place that's not as beautiful as it used to be. So, people won't be as attracted to come there. 
Uh, so we've got to come up with a way to balance all of these interests. Uh, you know, I would personally like, I walk by this area almost every day of the week, and yet I can't for the life of me really get a great handle on that area that we're talking about, limiting the, the street artists or the, the, the vendors of expressive materials to. I frankly wouldn't mind an opportunity for the council to see that. Um, I'm not sensing a huge rush to it. I'm not going to make a motion to table it yet, but I'm not seeing a huge rush to adopt these rules where we couldn't just spend a little bit of time to go out there and check it out. I know we're all familiar with it, um, but that would be my suggestion. Um, I, we have uh, one artist or two artists that sell their work together, I'm assuming. We don't yet have the situation with dozens. And so I'm thinking we don't need to rush into this. That's my thoughts. Michael wants to respond to that. Yeah, David, on a couple of levels. First, you know, I think it is important to get this done soon, very soon, to have it effective you know, 30 days from now because of the very issue that we could get a major influx of individuals come in, particularly as, as there's more attention to this, without any regulations in place. Uh, this particular location, I think, was chosen by the Commission because it was felt that it would not detract from the scenic beauty of the park, which is one of the criteria in the case law, that it is also visible to everyone coming to that part of the park. You have to go by this location to see it. It's where the primary parking lot is for people visiting the lighthouse. So it is, it's very much, you know, making sure that everyone has an opportunity to express their, uh, their speech, their, their, their rights to display their artwork. Uh, you know, th there have been a couple of concerns raised with this area on whether or not it's level. Uh, and, uh, you know, safety issues. You know, t to me, when the commission, you know, said vendors may only vend expressive matter or perform at specific designated locations identified by the town manager or his or her designee, and then it went on to say the designated location is to vend expressive matters adjacent central parking lot, specifically the area starting, and it's, it's that area next to the parking lot there. You know, it's not the flattest area. And <clears throat> to me, you know, if that's where the commission wants this, there's a burden that then falls onto the staff, which to make sure that the constitutional right is protected, which means that it does need to be safe, it does need to be flat, and and, and that's I think can be accomplished fairly easily. Uh, you know, we we you know with just a little bit of leveling uh, that that can be done. But it is important to be safe. It it is it is important that it be available to everyone to see, and you know. <clears throat> Beyond that, when you look at other areas, you know, the thing about Fort Williams uh, Park is that there's lots of slopes all over the place. And, you know, in, in particular, you know, we could put it in some other flatter areas, but it doesn't meet the standard high enough in the case law of being really accessible to where people are and, uh, you know, being visible to everyone. You know, if we put it in some other flat area, it could, it could be, well, you know, you, you're pushing it off into an area where they're just on people. And, you know, that's not the intent of what the commission's come up with. So I think this is a reasonable compromise. I would also like to point out that there is a provision where exigent emergency circumstances exist. The town manager may relocate the vendors or the vendors uh, to, to another location. And, you know, that, if this area is found to really have substantive issues, this, this policy as drafted you know, I think provides an awful lot of guidance in terms of the general area where this is desired and to try to accommodate that so the constitutional, uh, our constitutional rights are protected to make sure that we're protecting the other's constitutional rights. I didn't come up quite right, but I think you know what I mean. Frank? And Dave, you want to? I, I remain unconvinced that we need to adopt these rules tonight, but I'm happy to hear your point of view. It's just like the Conservation Commission is going to make recommendations to the Council about Greenbelt Trails, and we have a duty as members of the Council to go and look at some of them that are causing a lot of controversy, and we just don't take the Commission's word for it with all due respect to the Conservation Commission and with all due respect to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, whom I have a great deal of respect for, but I'm not seeing that this is an urgent matter that requires the adoption of these rules tonight. We've had so far one or a couple of artists selling their work together, as far as I know. 
We haven't been overrun yet, so I'd like to spend some time looking at it. Frank, you had a comment. Yeah, it's basically in response to Mrs. Christ Mrs. Christensen's description of Portland situation. Um, the fact that the uh, Civil, Civil Liberties Union um, got involved, Portland basically gave up control of locations, and I'm wondering if we can get some uh, explanation for that versus our situation. And also, the number eight, um, I would imagine we'd have to come up with a justification for how we arose at that number, and I'm just curious what that might be. Caitlin? I just had a question about Mike's comment about moving it forward before we get bombarded for the 30 days. So if we wait and don't adopt it tonight, basically it would get put on next month's agenda. So then it will be 30 days from next month. So we're looking at this September September yep. before anything's adopted. Is that, you're shaking your head no. No, the, the ordinance takes effect 30 days After from the, the enactment. The rules take effect at whatever date you decide to have them take effect of, as long as it's 30 days from tonight. Right, so then it's not. It's on the agenda for August 8th that would take, a, take effect. Yeah. Right, what I'm saying is the rules, we can go on Dave's venture and yeah. next month when the actual yes, that day. ordinance goes into right. place, we can put the rules into place yeah. the next morning. Good. So it's not really pushing it back is what I'm trying to figure out. It does, it, you know, it pushes it back from the 8th to the 12th. Well. But it also pushes it back a little bit further because, you know, these things don't turn around in a dime. You, you have to have signage, you have to have, uh, you know, you have to consult with the different people involved. You know, you just, I think in fairness <coughs> to parties, it is good to give them fair and due notice of what the procedures are going to be. You just don't want, you know, a number of vendors to show up on the 13th and say, you know, sorry, you have to go to that location, so, you know, that you've set up there, sorry. You, it's just, you know, to me, the responsible thing to do is to give people fair notice and do this. So, David, just a, a, a redirect. Would, would you be inclined to vote for this if we were to strike the specific language that addresses the location? Um, because what Michael said, there is specific language about the central parking lot ordering Humphreys Road. Later on in the document, it gives the manager the ability to modify that. But if we were to strike that specific language, and it would be after central parking lot, it would be after. Yeah, Do, would would that be a modification that you would be accepting today, or you still believe a site visit is required? Uh, well, it would seem to me the location of where the artists would be able to sell their artwork is so integral to the, these rules that I, that doesn't make, it just doesn't make sense to me. And it may just be that I'm not understanding what you're proposing. Um, Go ahead, Mike. Yeah. What, what the chairman is proposing is it would read, the vendors may only vend expressive matter or perform at specifically designated locations identified by the time edge or is there a designate. The designated location vendors wishing to vend expressive matter is adjacent to the central parking lot, period. You'd eliminate specifically the area starting. So what it does, it, it sort of sets it up in that area right around the central parking lot, which meets the, which is not on the, the field next to the White House, which takes away from the pristine beauty of the park, but yet is protecting the rights to be seen, to be visible, and to be near the cars. So I, the only other piece it provides is the ability for the, the question about whether it's level and it's accessible, not only to the vendor itself, as well as to the general public. So Personally, I think it's a mistake to develop these rules with the specificity that's in them. So if, if the food vendor experience has been any indication of in the park, you want to work with everyone and work within a general framework of understanding. And, you know, we, we've moved the vendors a few feet from time to time. Uh, we, you know, we, we got input. We moved one across the street. We've moved the hot dog vendor from one side of a path to another side of the path, all in keeping with the desire to, to uh, work with their businesses as well as to uh, make sure it's safe and, and in a good place that isn't ex any further exposed. So I, 
you know, I think that's a reasonable compromise, David. So if that were to be uh, the case, uh, David, uh, would that change your... It, it, would, it would not. And I, I respect a great deal the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. I think I've supported virtually everything that they've recommended for the fort. I, I am just, I'm not seeing this rush to judgment. Um, so, but, you know, if I'm outvoted, I'm outvoted. I'm just, I would be inclined to table this to the next meeting. I, I'm, I'm just not seeing much of a downside. We, we, I'm, I'm not hearing that we have a lot of artists lining up to sell their work in Fort Williams. Yes, Jamie. Yeah, I absolutely agree with David. I think it should be tabled. Um, I, I read through the regs, and I think there's a lot of holes in them. Uh, I think they need some marking up. Uh, I did a lot of yellow line already. Um, I'd like to read the case law involved. Um, I don't know if it's limited to Second Circuit, if there's any U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, if there's any state law, um, if it's just Second Circuit, then we're not bound by it. Uh, it can be uh, you know, informative to us and, and helpful, but I'd like to read the case law. I'd like to see the site like David suggested, and I'd like to mark up the regs because with all due respect to Monahan Leahy, I think it needs work still. Anyone else? Kathy? Okay. <laughs> Um, I agree with Dave and Jamie both. Well, the lawyers are all working together. We should, um, <laughs> that much. I mean, we're talking four days, and <laughs> the people that are in the park now have had plenty of notice. They are fully aware, and anybody that's interested in joining the, you know, any art in the park, they will have started to hear about this already, which is the fear that they're going to come in the masses. Well, we can't stop them for 30 days anyhow, so they've got 30 days notice right now that we're looking into and we obviously want to do something, so we just need an extra month to decide what we're going to do. You know, I, I would suggest if the council wishes to table this, they wish to mark it up, they wish to do all these things, that in fairness to everyone, that maybe you appoint a committee of the council to do that and to meet between now and the next meeting, because I think, you know, there ought to be something on the agenda at the next meeting that people have a sense of what you might be voting on rather than to people show up at a meeting and to be subject to a lot of different amendments at that point. Well, uh, I'm seeing three folks that are interested in, uh, in putting this. I, I see the work committee already, too. I see, <laughs> I see three people that are more than happy to do the work that's required between now and the next meeting. I'm more than happy to table this if the three people are willing to step up and do the work so that we have something substantial to deal with next time we meet. I'm not happy to put some work into redlining it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just to Carl's point earlier, I'm, I'm a big fan of the First Amendment. I've litigated a lot in my life, but um, I also agree with Carl that I, I happen to agree this is a commercial activity, and I'd like to see what the case law has to say about, you know, you can have First Amendment speech that's art, art, artistic, but it's also commercial and, and where appropriate regulations come into play there. Okay. Frank, anything to say? Nothing to say. You're listening. Lawyers. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the three lawyers are doing the talking. That's good. Uh, well, we have a motion and a second. So to table it, we need yes, someone needs to move We need but, to move. Uh, yeah, before, and I haven't uh, made that motion yet, because I know that sort of cuts off discussion. Uh, but let's just assume the motion to table passes. Uh, will we then be able to entertain motions to determine a, a plan of action for next steps, including either a special ad hoc committee or a workshop or a site walk? So the, the motion to table doesn't sort of cut off all the, that discussion, does it? David, I would suggest you make a motion as to what it is that you you believe the council should do. I move to table uh, consideration of the proposed rules for uh, vending in Fort Williams. Second. Seconded. Frank, and discussion on this? I don't, do we actually discuss a motion to table? Well, no. 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 Then all those in favor of tabling the motion? Four, two. So now. You didn't ask for opposed. And all those opposed. So, do we wish now to entertain a motion about the work that needs to be done between now and next meeting? I mean, it seems to me it's, it's tabled without clear direction. 
Well, I'm, I'm admittedly a little frustrated by the tenor of the town manager's comments back to me as well as the council chair, which is basically, you guys haven't done anything yet, so you need to step up and do all the work. Uh, so frankly- I don't uh, think I said that. Well, that was, the tenor of, that, was a, that was the tenor of your comment, Mr. Chair. So uh, I'm happy to entertain how we go about doing this, but I'd like it to be perhaps collaborative. I'm not, I wasn't prepared to vote in favor of these, and I, I think that point of view should be respected. Um, I think we ought to have a workshop of the council. I'm happy to be uh, to participate in an ad hoc committee, um, but uh, you know I'm all ears. Uh, I, I haven't really thought it through. I, I was thinking the, the same thing as David that a workshop might be appropriate. I'd like to meet with the the lawyer for the town to see what. Case law, yes. I don't know if there was any memo that came out of this or it was just an oral presentation. Uh, it seemed like from the memo that Kathy discussed that he met with the ordinance <coughs> committee, but uh, the gentleman from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission said he met with Mike and himself, but maybe he met with two different groups. Met with both, separate. Yeah. Okay. But I don't know if there's any written work product, and I typically would like to see some written work product if you're discussing case law and then the case citation so I could see what we're talking about. Why don't we move forward to a, a, a workshop of the entire council? Does that make sense? And we could include with that a site walk so we could look at the area. Workshop. So um, maybe after the meeting tonight, we'll try to schedule it. Yeah. We're not on camera. Great. We usually don't discuss workshop timing on camera because we don't like <clears throat> to disclose when everyone's going to be away on vacation or not home. So. Okay. All right. Is that acceptable will, to do the that? The workshop date will be posted okay. tomorrow. All right. Let's move on to item 99. Good table annual license. We have a motion. Let's push the minute. Spend more time on that. Anybody? Would anybody like to make a motion for the good table license? I move that we approve the good table license. For the Venus, Spiritus, and Malt. And do I have a second? Second. Seconded. Do you have any uh, discussion? Okay. Seeing no discussion, all those in favor? All those opposed? It's unanimous. Item number 100, the library policy update. I guess, Michael, would you? Tee this one up. Yeah, these are very minor updates to the library policy. Uh, I think really a case of the the library trustees dotting the I's and crossing the T's, and has to do with the gallery manager that they now have, who's a member of the trustees instead of a uh, the arts commission who 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 looks at the different policies. And the public relations policy reflects their existing work doing various social media. Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a motion. Anybody? David? I move that we approve the updates to the Thomas Memorial Library displays and exhibits policy and the public relations policy. Do you have a second? Jamie? Thank you. Is there any discussion about the library policy updates? Anything? Seeing none, all those in favor? All those opposed? It's unanimous. Item number 101, the purchase of the remainder of the Lovett Ayers parcel. Michael, do you want to tee this one up for yeah, us? Yeah, this is a uh, parcel of land of 18 acres uh, behind Sherwood Forest. Over the last 10 or so years, the town has been acquiring fractional interests of the land. At one point, we had the town attorney do a full title search and found that people owed at one point as much as, as little as 100 and, one one hundred twelfth of the property. And uh, between foreclosures and trying to notify individuals and notifying the neighbors or whatever, we've not, we had come to the point that we had one party that was still outstanding, and now that party is willing to sell their three 112th fractional interests to the town. And the proposed motion would provide for that, and the funds would come from the town's land acquisition fund. Okay. Any discussion? Frank, that's a question. I recall that they had come to us and proposed that we buy it at a certain price. 
This is less. Yeah, much less. They, they, they proposed much higher. So this is much less. Yeah. And this is the an agreed upon price by them? Did they have submitted this in writing to the town attorney. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Any additional questions? I know oh. Caitlin didn't want to spend that much, I know. Yes. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I, it's better than what they asked for. I think all of the discussions have been in executive session up to now, so I don't want to <laughs> say anything more. All right, any further conversation? All those in favor? Uh, yeah. We don't have a motion. We don't have a motion. Uh, motion, entertain a motion. David? I move that we accept the offer of Philip Clifford Sr. and Susan Clifford to sell their fractional interest in the Levitt Heirs parcel as outlined in our materials tonight. We have a second. Second. Any conversation, discussion? I think this is exciting that we're actually completing the town's acquisition of this parcel all, and I understand some of the reservations that have been expressed, but I think it's a great thing for the town to accomplish. Yeah. Mm. Agreed. Agreed. Any additional comments? Having done this, Mike, and followed through it with their uh, requirements, are there any other, would there be any other plans from a uh, uh, green belt standpoint or any acti actions we might take now that we control the whole, the whole parcel? Yeah, it's something we need to talk about in the future. We've had some discussions uh, over the years about that, but it was never with now that we've fully acquired it. So, you know, like anything, I want to check with the councilors who are sitting here now and not the ones that were sitting here two years ago. Right. So. We need to have that discussion. Okay. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you. Moving on to item 101, the effect of the state budget adoption. Michael? I think everyone's aware the legislature adopted a new state budget in late June. Uh, it had its ups and downs for Cape Elizabeth. Uh, the, uh, at the very last, at the end of it, uh, the different compromises resulted in the state school subsidy for Cape Elizabeth being uh, 451,764 more than was in the original state budget and, and the more than was in the, the school department's uh, estimated revenue. Uh, the school department is continuing to take a hit in the state budget of 299,004. Uh, state retirement uh, for teachers, which they have included in their budget. Uh, revenue sharing, uh, the governor had proposed to eliminate it. We ended up with 451,764 instead of the, the, uh, the amount that was in last year's budget, which was carried to this year of 640,000. And the homestead exemption, the governor had proposed to eliminate it except for senior citizens and to slightly change the, the varying amounts. So we did not spend a lot of time honing the amount in the budget, and it ended up coming back that the cost of it, according to the, the assessor, uh, for our share of the cost would be $195,242. Anyway, uh, the effect of all this, if you incorporate all those changes, is that the tax increase would be 2.8% or 44 cents, which is 12 cents less than uh, you adopted in uh, May when the budget was adopted. You know, as much as possible, I tried to, in coming up with this, mirror what the citizens, I tried to mirror what you adopted in, <clears throat> in uh, May, I believe it was, and to no way change uh, what the citizens voted on in terms of the budget, which, the school budget, which was basically that the school expenditures stay the same. Uh, their revenues were stated in the budget. However, it did say that there was a paragraph seven that said that if there was more unanticipated state, state general purpose aid, that uh, <coughs> it would uh, accrue to, to reducing the local appropriation. I'm also proposing a paragraph be included in a draft motion that you have with you, uh, that you have before you. Uh, this concern, well, this is only anticipated revenue. It could be a curtailment. It could, this could happen <coughs> or that could happen. So there's a proposed paragraph that if the state should, during th this fiscal year that began July 1, curtail or otherwise reduce the school subsidy, that we would hold the, the schools harmless uh, so that uh, there would not be any impact from them to, to them from the curtailment. So 
happy to answer any questions you have. And I noticed the superintendent of schools is here and the school board chair and the school, school board finance, finance chair. chair. So the motion that we need is in the italics. So whoever does like pose this motion uh, would would like it um, read into the record if um, someone is willing to do that. And we'll get a second. Anybody willing to do that, finance chair? The entire italics has to be read into the record. Let's see if I can handle that. Um, so I move that we accept uh, this. Uh, Restated budget uh, from the budget adopted in May to conform to the state budget adopted last late June, and uh, it would read so, it would read as as this: I ordered the Cape Elizabeth Town Council, having held a public hearing on Monday, April 29th, 2013, and having received revised estimates following the adoption of a state budget, does hereby restate and approve the general fund budget for fiscal year 2014 with gross expenditures of $33,264,411 and gross revenues of $6,458,461 and with the amount of $26,805,950 to be raised from taxation and to fix Tuesday, October 1st, 2013 and Tuesday, April 1st, 2014 with the dates upon which, upon which, upon each of which one half of such tax is due and payable interest to accrue upon taxes due and unpaid after each such date at the rate of 7% per annum in accordance with 36 MRSA section 506 the tax collector and town treasurer are authorized to accept prepayment or decline prepayment of taxes not yet committed or prior to any due date and pay no interest thereon in accordance with with 36 MRSA section 506-A uh, taxpayer who pays an amount accepted by the tax collector and town treasurer in excess of that finally <coughs> assessed shall be repaid the amount of overpayment plus interest from the date of overpayment at the minimum annual rate per annum set by the state of Maine. If the state of Maine shall during fiscal year 2014 curtail or otherwise reduce the state school subsidy from the estimated $2,620,194 the town shall provide an amount equal to the amount curtailed or reduced from the unassigned fund balance to the Cape Elizabeth School Department so that the authorized expenditure amount is unchanged. With the rest read as well? Yeah, please, if you would. This restated budget approval reflects three revised estimates. State school subsidy from $2,192,506 to $2,620,194. Main state revenue sharing from 640000 to 451,764. Homestead exemption local cost from 157,000 to 195,242. Thank you, Frank. We have a second. Caitlin, thank you. We have any discussion? You said it all, Frank. I've said it all. <laughs> <laughs> I said it all. Um, all those in favor? All those opposed? It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, we come to the last item, a citizen's second opportunity to discuss items not on the agenda or any citizens here that wish to address us or items that are not on today's agenda. Seeing none, the chair will entertain a motion for adjournment, but prior to that, we will have a brief workshop after this meeting to discuss foreclosed properties mm -hmm. and then to have a board of the Museum of Portland Headlight meeting. Have an in have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, seconded? Second. David, seconded. All those in favor of adjourn? All those opposed, it's unanimous. Thank you.